Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning and want to just say welcome. First of all, good morning and welcome. And thank you for coming um, to our session. Um, today, we really want to um, have an opportunity to present um, various perspectives on how we can bring health equity um, into our CF care. And so we have a variety of um, presenters that are going to be speaking on different topics as it relates to diversity. Um, and we're hoping that from the various presentations today, we actually all can walk out of here with having some practical strategies, practical tools, and how we can assure that we are really striving and being intentional on how we can assure that we are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So our first speaker for this morning is Dr. Susanna McCauley. And so I'd have your presentation up. Right. So. Um, see. Sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. No, don't. <laughs> so click on begin. Begin, yeah. And then click on the time on the right. So oh. There. And then, and then, uh, so then click start. And then there's. There. Oh, okay. Okay. And click open. <laughs> and then it should work. And then. This seems to be working the best. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about this. And uh, this is a different um, talk than some of you might have heard me give before because it's actually very personal. Um, but I'd like to give you some insights for your professional practice. So um, today's theme is cystic fibrosis and developmental disabilities. Um, I have a number of disclosures. Um, the only one that is legally, or at least um, professionally required, is that I am an advisor to Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Um, that's not related to my presentation. Um, but I'm going to be talking about my son today. And he, um, he gave his permission for me to discuss, but he didn't want to be involved in the creation of the content. And um, that made me a little bit sad because we should be looking at members of communities to give us input when we're talking about inequities. Um, I'm also going to say that, you know, I'm a white woman. I'm a professional. I have a lot of unearned privilege and power. My parents were university professors. Like, going to college was no mystery to me. Um, and that, that gave me, you know, even when I had college interviews, it was like, ooh, because the academy loves the academy. Um, so these are unearned things that really influence my experience a lot. Um, and they influence my perceptions a lot. Um, but most of all, they really uh, influence the outcome of my son to date. He's still a young, he's a young adult. He's in process. We're all still developing, it, no matter what age or stage we are. Um, but uh, his outcome has been quite good, and not all kids who have his disorder have good outcomes. I wanted to make sure that everybody saw this. It was in the headlines, but it depends what you read, and we're all overwhelmed with information. So um, this has been something in discussion for a long time, but it's important that you know that the National Institutes of Health, as of a little over a month ago, has designated people with disabilities as a population with health disparities. And um, I work a lot with people who work with people with disabilities. And as a pediatric pulmonologist, of course, I've cared for kids with muscle diseases, cerebral palsy, um, and all kinds of genetic disorders other than CF that cause disabilities. So this is a population at high risk for health disparities. Um, and it's everything from um, not being treated in a manner that recognizes your full intellectual capacity, such as people who have good cognition but can't speak, 
Um, to people in wheelchairs, and I do have a wheelchair user in my family as well. So these are the things that I want you to know. I want you to know that neurodevelopmental disorders often present as behavioral problems. Um, it's a kid who is not quite conforming to the parenting that nobody's perfect at, but we all try and we all get the information that's accessible to us to do. I want you to know that autism spectrum disorder is common. It interferes a lot with family life. It interferes with social functioning, learning, and communication. So it is pervasive. I want you to know that early intervention and support of autistic people can help them thrive. And just like in cystic fibrosis, the earlier you detect and do intervention, the better the outcomes are. So as a newborn screening researcher in cystic fibrosis, I've thought about this a lot. And then you, as a CF team member, whatever your role, may be among the first to identify signs and symptoms of autism or other neurodevelopmental disabilities because you see these families more often than any other healthcare provider. Most pediatric um, offices, some do, but most don't have a social worker who can talk about what's going on that's causing um, some stress or what you might see as non-adherence. So this is, um, this is the story of my son. He was a healthy term baby born in 2000. Um, I was an elderly mother. <clears throat> this is a cruel thing on medical records, but Early on, he was a very pleasant and cuddly child. Um, he had early play quirks, which because of when I trained in pediatrics, I didn't recognize were uh, symptoms. But he would put his cars and trains in lines instead of doing the back and forth thing um, that those of you who might have children um, have seen. And he loved to spin things. So he, as a toddler, he would get out, we had like plastic plates in the low cabinet. He'd get them out and he'd spin across the floor. It was actually very cute. It was funny, it made us laugh. He had very terrible twos, but terrible twos are pretty terrible, again, for other parents out there. He had a lot of difficulty with toilet training, um, particularly with bowel movements. So he would pee in the potty, but he would like ask for a pull up and go off in a corner. He had um, problems interacting with other kids at preschool, and he had the most difficult thing was unpredictable meltdowns where you'd just be going through the community and suddenly the kid was screaming in terror as if he was in pain. And so um, it took a while for me to denormalize some of this, and this is not unusual because as I said, terrible twos are terrible. Um, so at the three-year checkup, really brought this concern to his pediatrician who said to me, you guys need to be more consistent in your parenting. Um, we were counseled about uh, consistent use of behavior, and we were referred to a family therapist. So let me tell you something. I am not perfect at all. I am not, you know, managing behavior is a problem. Sometimes I um, am tired. Sometimes I am inconsistent. But I'm not a bad mom. And my then husband and I were not inconsistent. We were like, how are we going to manage this? And we were consistent. And I will also tell you, I think family therapists are amazing. But I knew this wasn't a problem that was just us. And so I, privilege one, self-referred to my friend and colleague who was the chair of psychiatry and, and said, you know, there's something going on with my kid. I'm being ignored. Can you see him? So history, observational assessments, very thorough, very complete, very exhausting, very expensive neuropsychological testing led to initially a diagnosis of pervasive developmental disorder, which is kind of a pre-autism before you have um, more history, and then finally to autism spectrum disorder. 
And the thing about getting a diagnosis is that it got treatment. And I want you to think about that also in people who have CF phenotypes and not a proven diagnosis because people can get sicker and they can have permanent decline if you do not get them into treatment quickly. So it took a long time to get services. We were eligible, of course, for early intervention through the state, um, but also had the privilege of having insurance that paid for some of these services, but there are very long waiting lists for developmental services. As far as I know, everywhere in the country, the Chicago metro area and the state of Illinois are particularly bad. So he um, he was able to start therapies. He started a, in a state preschool program with special ed services, and then he was um, mainstreamed with a full time age aid at age five. So I'm not going to get into this, um, but there is a lot of screening for autism that can be done. There are genetic disorders that are associated with autism. Um, but this is not a single gene defect, and it's got a lot of uh, symptoms. But the American Academy of Pediatrics has a guideline, and there are screening guidelines for neurodevelopmental disabilities for primary care doctors. The actual um, in, in practice uptake is quite variable. So again, this is an official definition of autism spectrum disorder. It's a neurological and developmental disorder. It affects how people interact with others, communicate, learn, and behave. Um, symptoms usually occur in the first two years of life. They're infant symptoms, but again, they may not be screened for. Um, but there are difficulties that I mentioned before, and, and there are restricted interests with repetitive behaviors, and these really affect all of life. Um, autism spectrum disorder is common, so you definitely have people with autism and CF in your practices. It's about 1% of girls and 4% of boys. Prevalence is similar across racial and ethnic demographic groups, but there's a lot of variation by state, um, and this probably has to do with access. And diagnosis is often delayed, and it may be more delayed in people who are from marginalized groups who may not have the access to, say, a head of psychiatry or private insurance like I have. Um, there's a huge rate of co-occurring health disorders, which include digestive problems. Um, constipation can come from the kind of problem that my own son had, sleep problems, depression, and anxiety. So think about the CF population and comorbidities, and this can make it worse. I did not a formal literature search, but to my knowledge, there is one paper um, on autism and cystic fibrosis, which was recently published. And as you might imagine, um, as editor in chief of this journal, I was very interested in when, when I got this paper, but I did not buy, I, it was not a biased review. It was a well done paper, small series from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, and um, they very nicely laid out some of the clinical barriers for people with CF and autism. So sensory processing, environmental overstimulation, intolerance to procedures and changes in routine. So think about your CF clinic. In hours, we generally have a bunch of team members going in. We have a preferred order, but we don't always follow it. And um, that can be very overstimulating. And so, um, there are two ways that you can help. One is to bring attention not, I don't expect anyone in this room to make a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, um, but remember sensory symptoms can present as feeding problems. Um, the, in early life, there can be feeding problems. There can be lots of difficulties with textures. There's a lot of sensitivity in many people with autism. So or transitioning to solid food or taking new foods, lots of irritability. Irritability in little kids who don't have a lot of speech is often attributed to the GI tract, and it can be. But just think about that kid who may have unusual GI distress and, and what that might mean. Um, atypical language development and atypical play, all of these are things that you may well observe where you can have a you know, questioning conversation, open conversation to think about. And a lot of times in these situations, parents are like, I'm so glad you brought that up because I have been worried about that, but I didn't know. And you know, you have a lot of anxiety about your kid when you're a parent anyway, and especially if your kid has CF. 
Um, for treatment considerations, you want to um, support sensory processing. So kids with autism can be sensory seeking, um, and that can be uh, wanting to fidget with something. Um, my son was sensory seeking. He had their chewy tubes, like he put on his pencil so he could like chew on his pencil during school um, in a way that is hygienic and allowed by his individualized education plan. Um, there can be a ton of intolerance procedures and there's a lot of rigidity. And so if you say it's going to be this and then it's like, eh, no, it's going to be that. And no, you're not going to see that person who you have a relationship this visit because they're busy with somebody else. That can be a meltdown. So you, you can't plan your whole CF clinic or what's going to happen there. Um, at all, let alone around one family that you're seeing, but you can think about it and not over promise or make things different than they are. And on the other hand, a visual schedule and an expectation of what is going to happen can be really important. And then co produce, do your preclinic planning, be very sensitive to that, the needs of that family. Um, so I've had a lot of challenges, um, but I've had a lot of gifts with this. Um, there's a lot of time and burden in this. Individualized education plan meetings can only be held on Thursday afternoons between 2 and 4 when all of the staff are there and nobody is assigned to see a patient. Now, it may not be 2 to 4 on Thursdays. It might be 9 to 11 on Mondays. But, but you have no... Uh, you either have it or you don't have it. There's no flexibility, at least in the Chicago public school system. Therapies take a lot of time. I had enormous co-pays. Very fortunate to be in a high-paying profession. Um, participation in research. We participated in research. We took that time. Um, it was very useful to us in some ways because we got some return of results. Um, there's a ton of community exclusion that's painful for parents and children a, a lot, and there's a constant fight. And just like anyone who's marginalized in any way, that puts an emotional um, impact onto your day that you have to overcome to function in the way that you want to present to the world. So be compassionate, um, be an advocate. I'm an expert at 504 and IEP plans. I really can help families with that. That is a gift that I've had. I have recognized symptoms of autism and other neurodevelopmental disabilities in patients in my practice and gotten them into early intervention. That is a gift. And then finally, and I know I'm at the end of my time, um, I wanted to show you some pictures. Um, I love this book by Temple Grandin, who is a famous person with autism, Bright Not Broken. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a great family my son has always been supported by his cousins. This is in San Francisco, Megan. Um, and uh, my son is good at languages, so he's fun to take to foreign countries. This is before a hiking trip in Italy. And finally, he um, graduated from college in May on time with a pretty good GPA. He really loves a fine wine pairing with his meal. <laughs> he may have gotten that from me. Um, and then finally, um, I want you to think about neurodiversity because there are many adults with autism, including my son, who don't want to be seen as people who have disabilities. They want to be seen as people who have special talents and different ways of communicating, who can be in your workplace, who can connect with you if they're in your practice. So thank you very much. Questions, yes, questions. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm a little over time and don't want to cut into the other speaker's time. Also, come on up because there's still empty seats up here. So please yeah, we're, join we're us. live just streaming. Not being rude, just come on up. If you were at the newborn screening meeting um, and didn't use the microphone, I might have um, raised my voice to make you use it. But I apologize for that. I think one of the other things to think about while we're waiting for people to come up for questions is that you know, when you have it, so you have a family that have been diagnosed with CF, and usually the CF diagnosis comes first, and that impacts the whole family structure, the stress level, the finances, and you get it sort of figured out. And then you're hit with a second whammy of an autism diagnosis or another developmental disability. And then that's like a whole nother layer of things you have to put onto it. And I just don't know how you could ever, you would have to have a parent do that as their full job. 
I just don't see how that would, like a family could handle that with trying to manage all the CF plus everything else. And just the amount of like economic impact and stress impact on that family is just enormous. And so I think that anything that like the CF clinics can do to support these families even more um, and, and ways to think about releasing that stress or helping them, it's just such a high need that I just have never heard talk about at NACFC before. So if there's any questions or people who would wanna share their experiences of things that have worked in your clinic, Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, there we now go. Now we can. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for your talk. My name's Melissa. I'm a social worker at Boston Children's. And the whole time I'm sitting here, I'm thinking of this one patient that we have. So I started in CF three years ago. And when I met this young man, he was 20 years old. And the mom kept saying, oh, he has Asperger's, he has Asperger's, he has Asperger's. And I was like, okay, <clears throat> did anyone ever talk to you about guardianship? before he turned 18 and she was like, oh, it was mentioned. And so I started going through his medical record. He didn't actually have a diagnosis. So I had to find someone who specialized in diagnosing adults with autism. So this young man had gone his entire life without any of the proper interventions. And so I just wanted to say like, this talk is so, so important because I think of this young man and how many things that he missed out on not getting any services, and he was going to CBT therapy. That's not what this young man needed. And everyone was frustrated because it wasn't working. And they were like, we're trying to get the mom to do different things. And I'm like, it's, it's not the mom. He has autism, and no one's been treating him. So I just wanted to thank you for this talk. I think it's super important. Well, thank you for your comment. I really appreciate it. I'm going to... Um I'm going to open the next speaker's slide since I messed up at the beginning. So we don't match matches yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. Trying to be helpful. <laughs> Thank you all. So we're really excited because we um, are having two families that are gonna be on Zoom to come talk to us to really tell us more of an insight of what it is to live in this paradigm of CF and developmental disabilities. So I'm so excited. So it's Dominique Lindell, um, Michelle Gutierrez, and Kat Lichtenberger. Um, and so they are gonna be coming to join us. And should I start the slides or are you gonna do it back there? You can start, okay. This one? Okay. Yes. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Dominique Liddell, and I have a six year old daughter. Her name is Penelope Rose Liddell. She's six years old and she's in the first grade and she has cystic fibrosis and autism. Um, she was first diagnosed with autism a little bit before her third birthday. Um, when she was younger, um, around like one years old, I noticed because I worked in early childhood so I could tell that her language was a little bit delayed. So I talked to her pediatrician and um, she referred me to infant toddler services here in Kansas City, Kansas. And we began speech, we began speech therapy for her. And as we went on and continued to do different strategies with her, her speech therapist then had us do a test um, to kind of see how she scored because she did have concerns that she might have autism. Um, with my daughter, um, it wasn't easy to diagnose her just because her cognitive skills were very high and she was higher in other areas. And at the time it was just like her language and her behavior. And so when we did get the evaluation, they still couldn't really diagnose her yet. So we went through a six week behavioral clinic. And at the end of that clinic, that's when they were able to say like, okay, we are going to say she does have autism. Um, 
our experience with autism, of course, is up and down. And of course, it's added, um, it did add a little bit of stress and it was a bit of a shock just because she does have cystic fibrosis and um, she has to take different treatments and medicines and things like that. So getting her to do that and to get her to kind of understand why she had to do that when she was younger, that was kind of hard. And then as a parent, you worry because you're like, well, if she doesn't take her breathing treatment today, I don't want her to get sick and things like that. But then you're also, sometimes you have to pick your battles. And instead of her screaming and crying and throwing things, you kind of just have to take a step back. So for our, my family, um, me and Penelope, our struggles have been just that medication piece. And then she also does have trouble sleeping. So that is still a constant battle. Um, now and she's on different medicines and then of course because she doesn't like to take medicine putting on her putting her on more medicine um, that's a that's a bit of a struggle for us um, we also um, we have a wonderful care team and I am very happy for that support because as a single mother um, it is very hard I am in communication with her dad but I am the sole caretaker and I'm the one who goes to every appointment and different things like that. So having that support system with the care team has been very helpful, even if it's just like them asking how I'm doing. Um, Cause a lot of times the family around us don't really understand, especially like within my culture, um, some of her behaviors is just being that she's being bad and then I then have to step in and be like, no, this is how she's processing these things. And this is why you're getting the reaction you're getting. So it's very good to have some sort of support system and someone who can, you can check in with. Um, and I would just say as far as like other things that care teams can do, I would say just to try to connect more families because I am a big advocate for my daughter and I always like to I like to meet other parents who look like me and also parents who don't, don't look like me and kind of hear about their experiences with CF and also children who have autism as well and I know just in my community I have a couple friends who don't really know where to go when they see certain behaviors in their children so since they know that I am very open and vocal about my daughter being autistic they definitely come to me and ask questions. And I think that would just be helpful um, just because it's always good to vent or bounce ideas off of other people and families. And sometimes you're a little embarrassed to maybe share certain things with your care team. But if it's a family and parents that, you know, are going through the same things, it's easier to talk to them. Um, other things I would just suggest, and our care team does this, um, they model a lot of things for her. So she's very um, enthusiastic and wiggly during her appointments and they're very patient with her. And when they're trying to like check her ears and just different things like that, sometimes they have to like let her hold it and then she do it to them and then she'll allow them. So I would just say the patience and sometimes modeling those things and also talking those things out before you just go to touch a child just because the child can like tense up and even though you know you know that you're not trying to hurt them to them they're just like no I don't want to do this um and that also goes into like building a relationship with the child um my daughter is very relationship based and if she does not really trust you she will give you a hard time um and with our care team she has built a relationship with everybody and then now that she's older and i'm able to explain a little bit more to her um it's not easier for people to come in and out she's still like bouncing around but they can kind of catch her focus a little bit better um and i would also say just always any resources that it care teams can find for parents that's always i'm always willing to learn new things or find different things that are helpful and strategies and so just connecting families with like different people who can help them and things like that even if um i don't always like speak up and say things 
And then when they like check in with me and like really talk to me, then I'm like, okay, let me just tell them and things like that. So that constant relationship building and being able to connect families to different things um, is very, very, very helpful. Um, we have been really blessed with a wonderful care team. And as a single mother, having that support system and knowing that I do have that has been really helpful for us. And we, we have our great days and we have our bad days, but I will say she has grown so much uh, um, and she's progressed so much. And even though it is very hard, um, just financially, and even with jobs and things like that, because she does have to do um, different, her doctor's appointments, um, and the re she is not in ABA therapy. And the reason why I've held it off so long is because of the amount of time that I know that will take for her. Um, so she gets a lot of help in her school district um, but now I am now moving forward to try to get her an ABA and that is going to be a little harder. So just the stress of like financial and things like that, it can be hard, especially if you don't have anybody to talk to and you're by yourself. So having the care team and some family members that have that support has been really great. Um, and so thank you so much for hearing our story and being willing to learn on how to make parents and patients lives better and be more inclusive. So we do have time if there's any questions that um, you might have for uh, Dominique. And then we also have a question that came up for um, Dr. McCauley as well. Do you want to go? Yeah. Sure. So the question we have um, was, what do you suggest for parents that may be completely unaware of autism symptoms in their child or somewhat put off or offended by the, men the mention of further assessment? Um, that's a great question. And I actually think that is also a question for Dominique um, and want to tell her that I loved your talk and um, I'm glad that you're care team is supportive of you and your daughter um, and uh, and that you had a good experience or at least as best as it can be with diagnosis so um, but your words were very meaningful to me so um, here's the thing when you bring up a concern about a kid's behavior um, there is this sort of automatic thing where it's a criticism of parents. Um, and, you know, I, I shared my story with that. The assumption was that, you know, she works all the time. She, like, whatever the assumption was, it was obviously my fault. And I, I want to share something else that I didn't say, which is that when autism was first described, um, the origin of autism was felt to be the mother being cold and detached from her child. And I would say, and Dominique, I'd like your opinion on this as well, I would say that there is this thread through communications about autism, that there's still a bias um, against uh, parents whose kids have autism, that it may be deeply seated in, in the culture and the history here. But getting back to the question, when you first bring up a behavioral concern, a parent's immediate response is going to be, I'm doing the best that I can. And this kid is hard. And sometimes this was my second kid. So this kid was different and all kids are different, you know, but um, different in a way that was concerning to me. I think the important thing is to be gentle um, and to say, you know, child has uh, seems to have a, a really hard time with some of these transitions. Sometimes that's a sign of other developmental concerns. Um, do you have any other concerns about that? And then c continue and then say, you know, maybe you want to talk to your primary care doctor about that ne the next time you see them. So it, in a very like humble inquiry way, tell me about your experience. Because a lot of families will be like mad 
um, or upset. And then they'll walk away and they'll say, you know what, I have been kind of, you know, I've been trying to like check this aside, but maybe there is something there and maybe I should do that. And just like any other kind of diagnostic or therapeutic thing, you may have to have a few conversations and you may have to, you know, observe over time. Dominique, I would love to hear what you have to say about that. So I totally agree. Um, definitely the gentle approach. I know um, when I was a teacher in early childhood, a lot of times we would always stress the parents um, that they are the expert on their child. And so, yes, taking that gentle approach of, you know, hey, this is kind of what we're seeing. Have you, you know, do you see this at home? Um, and just trying to get them to kind of talk instead of just saying, like, we see this, we think it's this. So just encouraging them and making them feel like they are doing a great job is just, you know, um, any, just like she said, that gentle approach of just, saying like, you're the expert. So we just want to see kind of what you're seeing at home. And yes, it will take a couple of conversations because you, you do get defensive. And I just, I know for me, a lot of my family was just like, there's nothing wrong with her. She, you know, she'll grow out of it. And I had to be the one to be like, no, there's something that doesn't mean she's going to grow up and you know, all, something's gonna be wrong with her. She's not gonna be able to function in life. So yes, I do agree that gentle approach and just encouraging the parents as much as you can and making them feel like we are here for you and not we're, but sometimes parents do feel attacked. So we're not attacking you. We're not attacking your parents' style. We're just here to help you and relieve some of that stress that you could possibly be going through. Wonderful answer. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Also, keep coming forward. Don't be, it's not rude. Come on up. There's still some seats up here in the front, so. So we do have two additional um, community members that are also gonna share their story today. We have Michelle Gutierrez, um, and we also have Kat, Litton Berger. <laughs> yes, good morning. I'm going to be speaking about providing inclusive CF care to families from a parent perspective. And I wholly agree with the speakers who went before me and were in a similar situation. So we can certainly understand the challenges and we would just like to share some things that have helped us as, as we've gone along. I'm trying to get my slides to advance. So as I said, I'm Michelle Gutierrez and also known as Kat's mom. I'd like to discuss a little bit about Kat's medical history before and after the CF diagnosis. I'll also give a brief summary of the current CF treatment regimen and We'd like to give suggestions for approaching comorbidities and other complicating factors, some of which have been discussed already. And we would like to give suggestions for creating welcoming spaces for individuals with disabilities and other unique needs. And finally, we'd like to talk about best practices in inclusive CF care. So my background is, although I've been a mom for over 36 years, I've only knowingly been a CF parent for about 11 years. 
despite receiving Kat's diagnosis of cleft palate shortly after their birth, we kept receiving additional medical diagnoses over the years, culminating in a formal autism diagnosis about 10 years ago. We long suspected that Kat was on the spectrum, but the formal designation only came roughly 10 years ago. In order of occurrence, Kat was diagnosed with a mild hearing loss, global developmental disability, speech and language delay, ADHD, chronic constipation, and ultimately CF and autism shortly thereafter. As far as my educational background, I have a BA in psychology from University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. I have a master's degree in special education with an emphasis in visual impairments from San Francisco State. And prior to entering the special education field, I worked as a technical editor here in Silicon Valley. And I'm now retired and am a mezzo-soprano in the Menlo Church Chancel Choir and a volunteer student and host family liaison with American Field Service, as well as a caretaker for my two grandsons who are age three and five. So as far as Kat's CF regimen, they do uh, airway clearance as part of the overall treatment, but it's not the overall focus for the CF treatment because the digestive symptoms are more severe than the respiratory symptoms. Treatment is focused on alleviating those particular symptoms. And we try to be mindful of keeping her on schedule with her airway clearance and also with, with oral medications. And fortunately, when she was quite young uh, in preschool, we coordinated with the speech therapist who also specialized in feeding disorders. And she was able to actually teach Kat how to take oral medications. And we just started with little tiny uh, cake decor <laughs> pieces. And once Kat was able to do that, we gradually moved up in size. And now Kat's a champion medication taker. So <laughs> j just, uh, a helpful hint for those uh, struggling with oral medications. And of course, mm -hmm. with with uh, the CF diagnosis comes uh, a lot of typically uh, oral medications that are needed. They have a sick plan as needed, which is just um, an increase airway clearance regimen with uh, inhalers and nebulizer treatment. As far as the focus for CATS overall health regimen, we focus on mental health and psychosocial supports including group and individual therapy sessions at least weekly. We have been very fortunate in that there is a psychiatrist on the CF team and the psychiatrist also coordinates the medications. So there is a point person for both 
the medications and psychotherapy. And she recommended uh, a specific group that is catered to Kat's needs. And Kat attends the, the group therapy sessions on a weekly basis. And that has been very encouraging for all of us. As far as treating CF patients with developmental disabilities, we would recommend that we treat the whole person, not just the CF patient side. We would recommend a focus on good basic healthcare practices. For example, we would encourage aerobic exercise to improve both airway clearance and to promote a healthy weight. Of course, many CF patients have the office, opposite problem. Uh, we're struggling to increase their caloric intake. In our case, because of certain medications over the years, we have more of an issue with uh, additional weight, uh, of being overweight. And so that, that can be an added challenge. We try to use individual strengths and interests, such as music, to promote healthy practices and address treatment goals. For instance, those interested in K-pop music can learn dance routines to increase their physical activity. And the added benefit of such activities is that they promote social interaction. So, for example, Kat has been involved with the K-pop dance club at the local community college, and that has led to social interactions and, and friendships on the campus, which has been wonderful. We would encourage collaboration with other team members, including educators, to address mutual goals across environments. Oftentimes, especially if you have a child on the spectrum, their IEP goals, their educational goals will tie in very nicely with other healthcare goals, including uh, CF treatment goals. We would encourage creating welcoming spaces for patients. And what that looks like for us is uh, we really appreciate when clinicians anticipate potential needs before they occur. For example, they make sure that snacks and drinks are available for patients who need to be in the clinic for long periods of time. We've had team visits that took two to three hours or more. And when you have a child, either a young child or a child with disabilities who's in the clinic for a long period of time, that can be really difficult. And sometimes it's just a matter of gosh, I need a snack or I, I need a beverage to keep me going and so I don't get as cranky. And it helps for the parents too. Uh, this was a little more challenging uh, during the COVID pandemic, but if you can have reading materials or Wi-Fi available to help the family members and the patient uh, pass the time while they're waiting, it's very helpful in the craniofacial clinic that we also attended. They had uh, children's programming so they could watch uh, children's movies. And so there was always something 
to entertain the particularly the younger children. And now that we're in the adult clinic, there is less of that, but they still have Wi-Fi. So, you know, we bring our smartphones and if needed, iPad or what have you. So we always have our portable entertainment available. And I would also uh, recommend a comfortable seating for patients and their families. Sometimes those sorts of things uh, go unnoticed, but uh, it's, it's just easier for families if they have a comfortable place to sit, particularly, as I say, if we're in the clinic for two or three hours. And uh, this was mentioned before, and I would reiterate that it's important to consider the sensory needs of patients with special needs or, or disabilities. And that is a critical one for patients on the spectrum because it, it can be uh, lighting issues, it can be um, feedback from electronic devices. And in our case, uh, we have an issue with globophobia and uh, and until you've experienced it, you wouldn't really notice how many places have balloons, not just birthday parties. It, it could be, uh, you know, decorations for a celebration that's coming up in the hospital or, or what have you. And something like that can really throw off uh, a child or young adult uh, on the spectrum. And we, we try to, plan ahead and have cat wear headphones and be mindful of uh, where we're going before we enter a room. I, I try to do a quick look around before we go into a clinic. But as an example, I went to the gym yesterday morning and I received a phone call before I started from the uh, adaptive PE instructor at the community college. And I, I was fortunate that uh, as an adaptive PE instructor, he is very mindful of certain challenges. And so he called me and he uh, told me that Kat had requested that he call me and uh, and chat. So I was able to chat with Kat and there was an issue with one or two balloons in one of the PE offices. And that seems like such a minor thing, but in our case, it, it wasn't a minor thing. It was very upsetting and we ended up having Kat take the bus home rather than just be totally upset during class. And we'll, we'll do some prep before next week so that in case a similar situation occurs, we can kind of nip it in the bud before it blossoms into a full panic attack. But that's that's just you know one of many sensory concerns that we need to be mindful of. I think there is uh, another speaker who will be uh, speaking in more detail about multicultural and multilingual resources, particularly in the Bay Area. We we definitely need to be mindful of of those needs and be aware that it could be a need for translation services, or sometimes it's just a matter of uh, different approaches in terms of different cultures that are here, um, as I say, particularly in the Bay Area, but in, in other parts of the country as well. And we would encourage that 
signage and decor are accessible and sensitive, such as flyers for holiday activities. So this, this seems like a minor thing, but it's very encouraging to us when we see, let's say flyers for Diwali and, you know, Hanukkah and Christmas and not, not only one focus because we do have such a multicultural community here in the Bay area. And it, it is becoming more so across the country as, as time goes on. We would also encourage clinicians to be open to using tools that are typically used in other departments or with other age groups. For example, visually based uh, PFT apps, which are usually used with children, can be used with teens or even young adults with intellectual disabilities or focus issues. In our case, there's this cute little app that has a chicken running across the, the road or uh, a pretend birthday cake. And Kat had used those in the pediatric clinic. And we've been able to arrange for the pulmonary therapist to use those same tools in the adult clinic, even though typically, of course, they're not used with adult patients. But those other tools have been very effective, even though they're not typically used in the adult environment. And lastly, I would encourage awareness that patients may be members of multiple communities, such as deaf and LGBTQ plus. In our case, uh, Kat is uh, an active member of the LGBTQ community, and we try our best to encourage those activities. And to summarize, I think it's important to use a wide lens when caring for patients and consider other factors that can impact the patient, such as obesity, intellectual disabilities, sensory needs, behavioral health issues, and sexual orientation. I would encourage you to avoid making assumptions about abilities or intelligence based on a single diagnosis such as autism, because as we say, it is a spectrum. So the intellectual abilities and other abilities can vary drastically from person to person. And finally, I would encourage collaboration with other teams and professionals to get ideas about optimizing care for individual patients. And we've been fortunate to have access to, to various teams. As I mentioned before, we were attending the craniofacial clinic uh, from a very young age and uh, that's just one of several teams we've been involved with. So uh, my parting thought is from Lynn manuel Miranda, who was the producer of Hamilton. The fun for me in collaboration is one, working with other people just makes you smarter. That's proven. And so not only does it make us smarter, but I think it also makes us happier. So uh, that's my bit and 
uh, there's a, a list of the references I I used, and uh, the the top one is uh, a real good uh, set of guidelines, not only for clinicians working with with uh, trans and non-binary patients, but even even uh, parents could uh, benefit from reading the guidelines if if they have a member of their family in the uh, LGBTQ community. Thank you so much, Michelle. This was like wonderful sharing experiences. Did Kat, we're, we're running a little bit over time. Did Kat want to give us a little, like come on in for just a second or? Oh, okay, let, let me have her just say hello. And I, I think we've lost the focus here, <laughs> but uh, let, let me have her say a few words. Kat? Kat? Will you please say hello? I'm shy. Okay. You're shy. Oh. She says she's being shy. So um, tell Kat we so appreciate um, oh. her letting you share her story. And, you know, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. And I think the main thing that she wanted to communicate and that has been mentioned before is that we ought not make assumptions about ability levels. Kat did not say mama until they were three and a half years old and now is attending college classes and being successful, uh, living, uh, I would say semi-independently, but on their own in a studio apartment nearby, about 15 minutes away, is able to use public transportation, the light rail, the uh, regular Caltrain, buses, Uber. So uh, that's not something we would have predicted early on. And we're happy to say that we've had a lot of success. I cannot take credit for that success at all. Uh, I've certainly been very involved in care, but uh, when someone tries to give me credit, I say it takes a village, and in our case, it takes several villages. So uh, we've, we've been very blessed to have uh, multiple teams helping us along the way. And it really has paid off, not only the early intervention, but having collaboration across teams and with other community members. So that that's the main thing that, that we wanted to communicate. Thank you so much. Every, let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. So our, our next speaker um, is Tiffany Rufino, who is, um, I'm lucky that she is our social worker, but she's here to talk about um, language barriers. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. And I just really want to thank all the speakers from the last presentation. You know, as somebody in the CF clinic who works with families who have autistic children, and as a mom who has a son with some neurodivergence, this was an incredible talk and really so needed. And thank you. So I'm going to be shifting gears a little bit and talking about addressing language barriers, and specifically some pilot programs and resources to support Spanish speaking families. Where's the trigger? Yeah. No? You can um, click on here. Oh great. Thank you. Matt. See if I can figure this. Okay, so I do have this I do have this disclosure, which I'll talk about a little later. And so I wanted to open this talk with this slide for a few reasons. First, I think it just is a beautiful way to honor Hispanic Heritage Month. And also I love the diversity that's shown in this slide, right? There's over 20 different countries represented, each with their own individual and mixed cultural and language background. And I think sometimes it's really easy to make assumptions and generalizations about communities. And it's just so important to really keep in mind that deep recognition of diversity. 
Okay, I think what's also really important for context that I wanted to share are the health disparities, right? And I hope that we're all really aware right now of the health disparities and inequities between white people with cystic fibrosis and communities of color with cystic fibrosis. I wanna credit Dr. McGarry for helping me with these next few slides and the research studies, but in this particular slide, it's two decades of research that have shown health disparities and mortality between white people with cystic fibrosis and Hispanic. There are differences in morbidity, right? This particular slide shows pseudomonas. For every single type of pseudomonas, Hispanic people with cystic fibrosis are at an increased risk of acquiring it, and the median age of acquisition is much earlier, right? And we know what this means in terms of long-term health outcomes. Eligibility for modulators, you know, we always hear about, oh, the 10%, right, who don't have access to a modulator, but when you really stratify based on race and ethnicity, the numbers look strikingly different, right? So when we're looking at this graph on the left-hand side, we see 92% of white people with CF are eligible for a modulator, any modulator. Only 70% of black, 76% of Hispanic, 81% of people identify as other races. So all the work that's being done right now on health equity and reducing these disparities in healthcare is critical and 100% where we need to be spending our energy. So as a social worker, where I came in with my team several years ago, we started this project, I think it was even in 2017, really looking at our community. We have a very big Hispanic community with a lot of Spanish speaking members at our CF center and just noticing the vulnerability of these families, you know, how much sicker their children were, what the needs were, and how few resources there were. So we thought, well, let's apply for a grant with Vertex. They had a circle of care program with that. Let's see what we can do, if we can create resources for the community. And so we applied for a grant and we're very grateful to receive one. We had two project aims. One was to improve disease management and quality of life through offering Spanish language educational programs. And the other was really to foster representation and community, right? Really creating that emotional support, creating that community, that sense of belonging, that sense of feeling cared for, not just for our families that we worked with, but for any families nationwide or even in other countries who could access these resources. So we started by building partnerships and assessing needs, right? So we consulted with the CF Foundation, we partnered with CFRI, we recruited a Hispanic patient advisory board, and we did a really thorough needs assessment. It was small, but we had nine families who were really gracious and sharing their time and their thoughts with us, talking about their experiences, what the resources were, what they felt their needs were. Um, it was really important to us you know, there's this phrase, nothing about us without us, right? We wanted to really, anything we were developing, we wanted to come you know, from the community, with the community. And so there are several themes that came up in the needs assessment that I just wanna to touch upon lightly. I know we're really short on time, um, but some of the things I wanna to touch on, one of the big themes was communication and education, right? So easy access to information. One mom said, you know, I've got the big book, but oh, it's, it's like so hard to read and she's sleep deprived. Like she said, could there be a video or just easy to access materials that just kind of have what we really need to know. Topic selection, families would be interested in everything. Uh, repetition and plain language. These are actually central tenets of health literacy for any family that we're working with, but were really critical. That came up as a theme a lot with the families. Power dynamics. My understanding in working with these families is that there's a cultural norm of politeness and respect, agreeing with the physician, even if you may not necessarily agree or even if you don't completely understand what's being said. And I heard time and again from the families, there was a hesitancy to ask questions. They really didn't wanna look like they didn't know or understand. And I'll come back to that later. And then we asked about comfort level having programs in their native language, right? So we were thinking about having a family education day and we asked them, how would you feel if we had this event in English with a Spanish interpreter versus all in Spanish? By and large, everyone was super grateful to have access to anything, right? But a lot of families did say, but you know, we really would be a lot more comfortable if it was in Spanish. We feel like we could really ask the questions we wanted to ask and we would just feel so much more comfortable. So we really tried to take that to heart. There were also themes about emotional adjustment, right? And I think these feelings are probably pretty universal, right? Fear, guilt, sad sadness, anger, why me? And, and we just have to ask ourselves, right? How are we making space for addressing these, these feelings? What are the resources we're offering? Do we have time in clinic and a limited clinic time with an interpreter to really be addressing these holistic concerns and needs? 
we asked families what helped them, right? What helped them to cope with their diagnosis? And there are some special nuances here I just, again, want to touch on briefly. So learning about CF, right? Encouragement from the medical team, so important. And as I said, in these clinic encounters, when you may be using an interpreter, are you making space for that extra TLC and encouragement and the repetition and, and questions? Families also talked about support from family and friends, right? We know that it takes a village to deal with something like cystic fibrosis and autism and everything else, right? It's so much. And for a lot of the families who speak Spanish at our center, not all of them, but a fair number of them, they may have been the only family here, recent immigrants, to, or not necessarily even recent immigrants to the United States, but all their family might be in another country. So not only do they not have the family support here, but the separation from family is yet one more thing that they're dealing with. So how are we really making the extra effort to connect, to connect people with support? And then support from peers, right? Which kind of goes along with that is talking to other families, having that network of support. So one of the first programs that we offered was a Spanish language family education day. And our idea was to have a pilot. You know, we in 2017 weren't aware of something like this that had ever been done before. And so we thought, let's give it a try and see if we can do this. And we had a hybrid event that was in person and also online accessible to anybody, regardless of where you live. And it was really developed with and for the community, right? So very intentionally thinking about what are the topics that would be hopefully of most interest. And so we had a doctor talk about CF genetics and modulator therapy with a specific focus on the Hispanic community. We had a mom talking about her experiences, emotionally adjusting. We had representatives from Compass and CF Peer Connect. CF Peer Connect was still fairly new at that time, so we were actually hoping to even recruit Spanish-speaking mentors through our program, which we did. We were very excited about. And when our program it was in 2018 that we had the conference. This was kind of the height of a lot of really bad immigration policies, frankly, that did a lot of harm. So there were a lot of ICE raids, deportations, a lot of concern over public charge, a lot of fear. Um, not all of the Spanish-speaking families um, are not residents, right, or citizens, but a lot of the families we worked with were and had a lot of fear. And so we had an immigration attorney come and talk to families about knowing your rights. What do you do if ICE shows up at your door? What are pathways to immigration? And she stayed afterward for individual consultations for families who wanted that support. So again, hybrid event. We thought a lot about technology. Initially, when we were doing our needs assessment and consulting, that was one of the big concerns people had was technology access because there's a wide range, right? Some people super tech savvy, some people not so tech savvy. And so we really thought about how to make it as easy as possible for anyone on any end of the technology comfort spectrum. And so we did away with any sort of need to, to download software like Zoom. I mean, we're all experts in Zoom now, but then we weren't. And it was just one click. CFRI broadcast the program through their YouTube channel. It was one click, very easy access. Speaking of technology, there was a CF Center in New Mexico that had a super innovative program where they invited all their families together to watch the event. It was live streamed, they had a big screen, and they all developed community and built a long-lasting support group from that event. Um, so it was a pilot, right? We felt it was really successful. The families all said they had a great experience, and I think this can be replicable. We learned a lot, happy to consult with anybody. I think we're stronger together, right? I think if there are different CF centers who are interested in partnering, I think we could easily replicate something like this through collaboration. Okay, so the other program we developed was a series of Spanish language educational videos. And there were two videos. Um, one of them was really more of an introductory video about cystic fibrosis. So we had doctors, respiratory therapists kind of talking about CF. And we also had three different families, right? A family with a young child, a family with a school-age child, and a family with a college-age child. And there's the adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So when you're dealing with this new diagnosis and you're terrified and you see families, yes, living with the difficulties of CF, but also living their best beautiful lives, right? Kids at the playground, kids doing gymnastics with their friends, someone going to college, like you see there's a future that's possible and it's with your community. It's all in Spang Sp sorry, Spanish, it's culturally sensitive and really trying to build that inspiration and hope, that representation, that community, that sense of belonging. 
And so that was our first video. And our second video was more of a deeper dive into just the emotional adjustment. We had more of a focus on one particular family who showed their emotional adjustment to living with cystic fibrosis. Such a wise, incredible mom, just so grateful to have worked with her and had the opportunity to learn from her and hear her story. So I'm gonna share just a quick two and a half minute clip from that video. Um, if you're like me and can't really read that far, if you don't have reading glasses, feel free to come up because it is, there are subtitles and I really want you to get the full experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share the video. Whoops, that didn't do it. Just click on the picture. Quiero que ella tenga la vida más normal que pueda y para ello a veces tengo que dejarla ser un niño normal, ¿sí? Tuve que hacerme lavado cerebral de, de relajarme y de pensar positivo y de dejarla ser un niño normal. Ya ella va al parque y juega y se ensucia. Cuidado personal es muy importante porque no, nosotros nos olvidamos de que existimos. A veces te, hay personas que decían, ¿no? ¿has visto tal cosa? Y decían, no me he visto ni siquiera yo en el espejo, ¿ok? Estoy, porque siempre estaba en función de, de la niña. Me di cuenta de que, que si el miedo era lo que yo estaba viviendo, eso era lo que yo le estaba pasando a este bebé, ¿sí? Y dije, pues si le estoy dando miedo, no creo que sea, no le estoy llenando de lo que yo quiero que se llene. Y yo quiero que se llene de amor, de esperanza, de cosas positivas. Entonces, tener esa conciencia de, de cuidarnos nosotros como seres humanos. Yo creo que todos los seres humanos tenemos que aprender a cuidarnos, a entendernos, a sanar muchas cosas que tenemos en la vida emocionalmente, espiritualmente. Ser mejores. Pues un niño con una condición especial realmente es una invitación insistente a que seamos la mejor versión de nosotros mismos. La mayoría de veces creo que nos enfocamos más en la parte traumática y entonces eso nos deja como, como frenados en la vida. Pero cuando nos comenzamos a dar cuenta que después de un trauma grande viene un gran crecimiento y nos enfocamos en el, en el crecimiento, es algo lindo. Escucho los pajaritos, pero no veo ninguno. Entonces te da una perspectiva diferente y una gratitud por la vida, por cada instante. Mira, vi un pajarito por ahí. ¿Viste un pajarito? Sí. Pero también aceptando, en cierta manera. Es muy importante. Es algo que permite más felicidad en la vida. Puedo esperar a lo mejor, pero tengo que vivir la vida como venga. Porque no podemos controlar la severidad de la condición como tal, pero sí podemos controlar la cantidad de amor que les damos, qué tan felices tratamos de que sean. That's just two and a half minutes. There's like 10 more minutes of it. It's amazing and she's amazing. I was showing the video to my husband. He's not even in CF for mental health. And he's like, where did you find this woman? She's so wise. And everyone who's seen the video, they're like, yes, I resonate with everything that she says and they feel seen. And so I encourage you to share this video with your families, right? Share these resources. I have a list. There's not a lot, but there's a lot more than there used to be, right? Mm -hmm. So these videos were added to CFRI's playlist. I was told this morning. Um, and the CIA Foundation will be adding them, I hope, in the next few weeks. Um, these playlists have lots of other videos that you can share with your families. The CIA Foundation has a Spanish language website now that's really amazing. There are two different support groups in Spanish. One of them has amazing educational programs monthly for the next several months. So share these resources, right? CF Compass, Peer Connect. I have this list. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna share my email address. If you wanna shoot me an email, I'm happy to email the list to you or have it in English and Spanish so you can share it with your families. Okay, so I wanna give a few tips for providers about working with families who speak other languages. And I wanna preface this by saying that there are layers and layers to this, right? Like this is a deep dive, working cross-culturally effectively 
And I wanna give you just a few things to walk away today, right? So a few things that are sort of top of the list. These are things that I pulled together from the Health Literacy Toolkit. If you've never looked at that toolkit, it's a phenomenal resource. So a few things I'll pull together, right? Asking all new patients what language they speak and read, recognizing these things may be different. Consider scheduling longer clinic visits for families who speak a language other than English, right? We talked about how if you are using an interpreter, it does take longer. You're feeling pressured. Take away that pressure. Give families the time that they need and that TLC, that support. Match families with a bilingual clinician if you have them, of course, obviously. Um, and if you don't, always use a certified medical interpreter, right? Don't rely on your staff like me, or just kind of like, oh, I understand a lot. I speak a little, you know, never use family members, never, never use children. Communicate clearly with plain language and consider reducing the overall number of messages, right? I mean, learning CF is a new language. And then you're and then you're interpreting into another language, right? So again, central tenets for health literacy that are good for everybody. Encourage questions. So I talked about the power differential. Again, there's layers to that. You know, I really want to share appreciation for a comment that Dr. Susan McCauley made actually yesterday in a health equity seminar. And she was talking about, you know, we're wanting to create a culture of trustworthiness, right? Making this feel safe for people to ask questions. And again, there are layers to that. And, you know, can we make normalizing statements and say something like, you know, this is a lot to learn. And Sometimes it takes families a lot of time and we are here for you every step of the way to talk to you every clinic visit. And we really encourage questions. You know, any question is it a great question. What question can we answer for you today? You know, employ the teach back method if you can do that. Um, ask about health beliefs. Is there anything I should know about your culture, beliefs or religious practices that would help me take better care of you? Obtain multilingual health education materials, right? I'm sharing some. There are resources for other communities that you serve and we can pull these together. Um, offer everyone help with forms in a friendly, non-stigmatizing way. And then, you know, our last speaker talked about signage, right? Think, do a walkthrough of your clinic. Think about how welcoming it is. Call the phone trees, like your clinic phone number, your billing number, your on-call number. Are these accessible to people with other languages? How hard are they to navigate? And then again, I mentioned, right, there are layers. It's a deeper dive and a really thinking about, are we creating an inclusive, welcoming fam uh, uh, environment for our families? So things we can do, right? Build diversity at all levels of staffing, rec representing the communities that we serve. Have inclusive family advisory boards and committees. And when you are having families join your boards, really make sure that their voices feel heard and they feel welcomed as members and they're not feeling like they're serving as a token member of this community. Ensure that diverse communities are representative, represented in educational events and in your newsletters. Invest in transcreation of written materials. Learn about your implicit bias and embrace cultural humility, right? The deeper you go, the more you learn. Like, it really shows in the, the way that you can show up for your families. These are my references. And as promised, this is my email address, phone number, feel free to reach out. Happy to talk more with anyone, partner with anybody. There is um, a lot of energy at this conference this year in creating a working group for um, Hispanic professionals and also people who are interested in supporting the Hispanic community. We've been pulling together email lists and working on developing this group. If you'd like to join, like to learn more, send me an email, I'm happy to reach out to you. Thank you. I think we have time for one quick question, um, and then we'll be moving on. <laughs> Hi, Sir oops, is this on? Yes, Siri Vaith from Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute. Thank you for that amazing presentation, and just thank you for the partnership that we have had. And I do know we thank you to the, all the social workers who responded to our survey about meeting the needs of your diverse patient groups. Please reach out to us. We are in the process of developing materials. We have the Fibrosis Quística and La Clase book. We'll send hundreds of them to your clinics to pass out if you need them. We have the funding for that, Spanish language newsletters. We also do have a monthly virtual support group. And right now we have more people from outside the US participating in that group yeah. than from our clinics here. So please, I'm so grateful to Meg and to Kate from Stanford who post our announcements on the listserv. But please, please refer your people to the group. And I'll just have to say the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute has been long term committed to the Spanish speaking community, like the amount of resources they make, 
the resources they put in, the the support they've given us is amazing. So please go on to all of their website and refer patients and get the materials because it is just fantastic. So thank you to me. This was amazing. Please contact all of us if you um, want more resources, want to hear about what what work we've been doing. But thank you so much. Thank you. Is this working? Is it working? So now we're going to have another presentation, and it's going to be presented by Gol Golinar Racy and Hossein Sadeki. So good morning. And thank you for inviting us and allowing us to talk about uh, Bridge of Hope. Bringing health equity into CF clinic through CF Bridge of Hope. I have nothing to disclose. So what is CF Bridge of Hope? CF Bridge of Hope is a not-for-profit small entity, is a community collaboration. And this collaboration consists of the CF provider, CF team, the community hospital, academic center, elected US representative, New York City law firm, and interfaith group of Wilton, Connecticut. So let me define the job of each group. You know what? I don't see the picture that is here in here. Soon this, this is the next slide coming. OK. Um, so let, let me define the job of each um, each uh, community group. So the CF provider and the CF team and the community and the uh, communication uh, advisor, uh, they provide pro bono services for the patient and the family. The community service gives us prorated fees for the patient and the family. The US uh, representative, either the senator or the um, uh, the congressman, they usually write letters or they, on behalf of the patient or us. When the patients apply for visa from certain countries, it's hard to get to obtain a US visa. So uh, they try to help us with that. The New York City law firm helped us to set up the Bridge of Hope um, entity. And the interfaith group of Wilton, um, which is the Jewish, uh, Christian, Muslim group, that we work together for transportation, the meals, the housing when the patient and the family come for a week to 10 days. So as you can see in this diagram, the patient with the CF is at the center and the donors and the, uh, the CF care team, the WIAC, the law firm, the, um, the families, the volunteers, they're all evolve around that. So to better understand this, the picture testifies to this diagram. The patient is at the middle, and all the volunteers, for example, the Ukrainian translator we had, the Chinese donor, the Polish IT, and all the volunteers are there to help the, uh, the patient and the family. The success to CF uh, Bridge of Hope is really a lot of collaboration, communication, and a teamwork. So that is so important in this uh, entity. CF Bridge of Hope, so what we do is patients from uh, resource-limited countries, they apply to, uh, to our website. And uh, these are the patients that they usually they don't have the education, the medication, the treatment readily available for them. The patient have to be in a stable condition so they can travel to US and the and they can stay here for a duration of a week to 10 days. This was a patient that we brought years ago. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the translator, the CF team, the CF nurse, uh, we're all involved with the care of this patient. So what is the aim of CF Bridge of Hope? Well, you know, there are a couple of aims here, but the most important one is for the individual and for the CF provider. 
For the individual, it is a lot of education. From the time that the patient comes to the office, um, they get uh, escorted to the visit room, so the infection control gets to be explained to them why we're wearing gowns and gloves, talk about nutrition, the importance of that, the food insecurity gets discussed with the patient, airway clearance, which is either manual or with a vest or aerobica, gets to be demoed to the patient, shown to the patient, um, sleep, the importance of sleep, the anti-inflammatory aspect of sleep, uh, we do uh, mental health screening, uh, GAD7, PHQ, with the family, with the, usually a patient comes with a, with a mom or the dad. So that gets to be discussed either through translator or if they know English, that's even easier, so we do that. The whole therapy gets to be explained to the patient. So the order of the medications, how to take it, that gets explained. Usually we show them a video of, you know, a couple of minutes of showing them what CF is, how it affects their lungs. Um, at that point, patient can, you know, ask questions, uh, again, through the translator or the patient by itself. Then the evaluation starts. It's a clinical evaluation. We do the annual labs, we do the spirometry, we do the chest, uh, chest um, x-ray. And all that gets to be uh, documented, written, explained to the patient, put in a folder, so the patient goes back to their home country, they have all that information. So they can, and we encourage them to share that with their physician, with their CF provider. So this starts a collaboration with the patient, with the physician if they want to talk to us or the physician can really see what we have done, so can follow the patient for the whole year that, uh, for the second coming of the patient. We have had physicians collaborated with us via Zoom, through WhatsApp from different countries like Ecuador, Cuenca in Ecuador, Mashhad of Iran, Lebanon, Israel, Pakistan, India, Armenia, Guatemala, and lately from country of Cuba. So again, it's a lot of education for that week or 10 days. It is intense, but this is, you know, we try our best to bring the patient almost every day to the clinic so they can understand, you know, the whole uh, education and the treatment for them. Uh, the, the stars, the red stars are the countries that patients have reached out to us and uh, we were able to bring them here. Patients have applied from uh, South America, countries of Ecuador, Colombia, Guatemala, uh, Trinidad, and then if we go to Middle East from Lebanon, Palestine, uh, from Iran, uh, we had patients uh, calling us from Kazakhstan, Armenia, Libya, and all over. Bringing patients from different countries it is difficult because, uh, as I think Suzanne was mention mentioning, that to be culturally oriented to their care and knowing their, you know, their background is very difficult. So we really try in this program to deliver the accessible, continuous, comprehensive treatment to them and, uh, and be in touch with the patient throughout the year. Uh, via WhatsApp and our uh, communication director, uh, she's here and uh, I'll introduce her later. Um, she's in constant contact almost daily with the patients. And if there is anything we have to do in our part, she passes the message to us. We do a lot of Zoom appointment with the patients to follow up. And we, as I said, we try to really be compassionate uh, for the cause. So this is a picture, this picture was taken in 2015. This is a father and a son, very nervous, worried, depressed, anxious, didn't know anything about, didn't know much about CF and the right treatment. And this is a picture of this uh, young boy just last week, he's in law school, uh, he's healthy, doing so well, he's as tall as his father, very happy. And we just bring him once a year for a you know, week duration and he does so well. So if you have any concern, question, you can, um, you can ask me right now or we can wait af after Dr. Sadegi's uh, talk.
<laughs> also, the QR code will get you to their website so you can see all the wonderful things they do. So I would like to thank the organizers, Ms. Gordon and Dr. McCary, for inviting us and including and raising this important topic. Um, so you may ask, why Bridge of Hope program? Uh, this can be summarized in uh, three bullet points. One, to give a chance uh, to a limited number of individuals across the globe uh, to come and have access to the latest uh, treatments and medication. Number two is to directly educate the CF, indirectly pro, uh, educate the CF providers where the patients come from. And three is to generate or organize collaboration pr uh, programs with the CF teams overseas. So this is the essence of the, my talk and let's examine, especially with the focus on number one. I have no uh, relationship to disclose regards to this presentation. So this disparity in outcomes is huge in underserved populations compared to the best medical centers with respect to quality of life and life expectancy. This was a child, um, these, all you need to do is take a plane either one hour or 14 hours to another country and you see you can go back 30 or 40 years behind. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a child uh, six years ago, and this was overseas in one of our, it actually is in, in, in Iran. And this is a child, the same child six, weeks, six years later, September of this year. Um, and if you say this doesn't exist anymore, this is a female 11-year-old uh, um, in September of this year. This is her fingers. And if you say, these are really talented individuals, these paintings, sculptures, and drawings belong to, uh, to that boy. And actually it's in my office in Stanford, Connecticut. So although life expectancy with C, uh, with, for people with CF has increased substantially in, in the United States, in this country, the same is not true for the global community. Without access to the highly effective modulator therapy, which I believe personally, it should be accessible to all. And that by itself a discussion on its own, and it was discussed actually very nicely yesterday. So if you put the highly effective modulator therapy aside, the life expectancy of an individual everywhere should be, with the knowledge that we have, should be around 35 years. Prior to that, that's the life expectancy, prior to the advent of highly effective modulator therapy. So now let's ex examine the life expectancy across the globe. You almost, you can have, you can distinguish there, there is a two-tier system. You have countries which have life expectancy greater than 50 years, US, Canada, Australia, Western Europe, and this is an underestimation. Then you have a group of countries, the life expectancy is less than 25 years. Uh, Central America, South America, South Africa, and Eastern Europe. And we, we don't even know, we don't have the data about Middle East and, and Pakistan and Northern Africa. So if you put them together, they're close by. And I don't want to become political here, but if you're a parent, living in Mexico, doesn't matter how high that wall is, you're going to cross that wall and give your, your kid a chance of a normal life. So we need to address the equity instead of building, uh, building walls. So if the if kid is in Eastern Europe is, or in Middle East, it's going to do everything that they can to go to that Western Europe. And we need to have multiple approaches uh, for the global, um, to address this global uh, equity. Some people argue that we need to, uh, uh, to teach the fishermen how to fish. 
instead of providing the fish. But this approach takes time. And if we take our time, there may be no fish to, to go after. So, there, there, so to bring this uh, concept home, I put a few photos and names of individuals who are not with us anymore. So this is Valid, a Pakistani kid, four-year-old, looked like a 10-month-old, couldn't even walk. The, the parents were carrying him. Then other names, Nelson, Zahra, Helia, Hannah, Mohammed, Douglas, Jacqueline. This is Mohammed, and this is Nelson. And this is a photo of a behind a colleague of mine in Cuenca, Ecuador, who shared me, with me. This is an artwork of the patients that are not with us anymore. So CF Bridge of Hope is a high energy in terms of time and effort, not for profit, con I call it a concierge uh, global CF program. Basically, they have access to the patient, to the family, to the to the treatments, and they can call any day, nights, any time. So uh, let me share some of the outcomes of the CF Bridge of Hope. The program became operational uh, in 2013 with one patient that increased to 12 patients in 2019, with a pause during the COVID pandemic, and 18 patients last year, and the numbers are a lot more this year. There have been no or few hospitalizations in their home country for this select compliant group. The medical cost of visits with pro bono medical evaluations and waived administrative overhead range from 1,000 in those with no IV antibiotics to about to less than 6,000 in those who needed uh, two weeks of IV antibiotics. The cost of travel and accommodation average about $5,000. So this is the acceptance process. The goal is to choose individuals who do not require in-hospital or ICU admissions, although we accepted uh, patients um, from adult um, uh, centers in this country. So I had a um, center from California refer the patient with the FEV1 of 30%. And we had frank discussion with that patient. That's within the last five years, it's, and he's, he's doing well and has been stable. So uh, families fill out the application, and that's the website. And in that application, we ask demographics of the caregivers, level of education, spoken languages, ability to afford airfare and housing. And regarding the individual, we ask about demographic, daily treatments, local CF physician information, sweat tests, fecal elastase, um, any genetic testing is, if available, any annual labs, and copy of a recent um, chest radiograph. So that's the QR code for the site. And I would like to end with this uh, poem from Sadi, uh, which is a famous Iranian poet. By the, name, by, the, by, the, by the way, it's Iran, it's not Iran. And, and if you can remember, just remember Italy. You don't say Italy. You say it. So that's. So. I've been here since 1977, so I've been trying to educate everyone. So, so the poem says human beings are. Oh, this poem, by the way, is placed at the entrance of the UN building in New York. And it says um, human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If, if one member is aff afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. In my opinion, CF Foundation has rephrased this poem into one phrase, leave no one behind. Before, before I, there are many people that I have to have a list of uh, thanks and appreciation, but there's one person I would like to point out, and I'm sorry for embarrassing that one person, but that's our communication uh, director for the CF Bridge of Hope, and she's a great individual. That's Bean Co Cochran, Mrs. Cochran. Uh, and she, 
She communicates with these patients on a daily basis, and all their concerns is passed to all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I went over time. No. So we do have our last speaker, but we want to ask if we could please, um, I know we're running over time, about five minutes, but if we could allow um, for our speakers to finish their presentations. Uh, we do have Susanna Menzel, who's going to speak as well. All right, good morning, everyone. As Chandra said, I am Susanna Munzel. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Augusta, Georgia. I have no relationships to disclose. I'm going to try to rush through some of this so that I can highlight the most important parts because we are low on time. Um, so this is just an overview of what we're gonna talk about. It is a lot. Um, starting with the definition of abuse, um, this is something that is probably widely known among social workers. I'm not sure if it's known among everyone else, but there is a, a guideline for states that they have to follow for the minimum requirements. It is broken down into neglect, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. I think physical abuse is the easiest to identify because obviously if you see a mark or a bruise or a welt or a burn, you're like, hey, I see this physical evidence of abuse, right? So that's a little bit more difficult with other areas. And in medical neglect, I think it's imperative that we look at actual factual information that we can pull in when we're making a report. There are different avenues for medical neglect. They look at the denial of health care and the delay in health care, which is kind of tricky. Some of what we want to what I want to focus on is provider bias and how that impacts how we connect with our families, how we relate with our families, what we think of our families, our opinion of those families. And so I want this to kind of be interactive and also open up our minds to just not be like defensive immediately, right? So like, raise your hand if you're a female. Raise your hand if you're a male. Raise your hand if you're white. Raise your hand if you're a black, Hispanic, or a different, okay? So like, these are, these are just differences, right? Like it's not something we have to be offended about, but it's also something that impacts our childhood, our upbringing, our experience, our life perspective that we bring into the exam room with the patients and families. But it's also part of their identity and outside of the exam room, right? Like they have a life 365 days a year, not just when they're in clinic. So if this was your family, what's your first visual that comes to mind? Do you think it's an easy family, a difficult family? Oh, I would love to have that as my patient, right? So like, what about, what about this family? Does that change your perspective? What if it's a Hispanic family? What if they're two gay parents, right? Like what if they're adopted? How does that impact your perception? Also, these are all Google stock images. None of these are my families. <laughs> I do not have permission to use them except for their own Google. So again, going into provider bias, that implicit bias is just that. It's implicit, it's there, it exists. I am a female. When I go into a room, I'm still a female. Right, so that it just is what it is. So it's not to say that this is a bad thing, right? Like everyone I think just gets defensive and they're like, no, I don't do that to my patients. I'm not judgmental, but it, it, it's just a part of who you are, right? So like if you can identify that, then you can address it and you can make sure that you're not being biased with that particular family. And you can kind of pull back like where that judgment is coming from and just take a deep breath and think, am I reacting to this family this way because of a specific reason? So, like I said, we all have a different lived experience. We have different lives, different impacts that happen to us. And we have to consider that diversity for ourselves and also for our patients and families. Even if you think of somebody that you grew up with, that you went to the same school, you went to the same church, in theory, you had the same life experiences. What about the home life, right? Like, what if they're 
married but fight every night? What if they're going through divorce? What if you have to do visitations every other week where you're switching your whole household, where you live in a whole different dynamic? What if one of the parents is a raging alcoholic, right? Like the the thing about those lived experiences is that it can almost have polarizing impacts on us as an adult so you can be completely desensitized to a situation or you can become hypersensitive to it so you can be like oh well my dad was an alcoholic and i'm fine right or you can say well oh my god his dad drinks his dad's an alcoholic we have to get him out of that home right so you can go to one extreme or another where you brush everything off or where you're hypersensitive to it because of your own lived experience not quite ready for that one yet so again as we think about that we want to kind of pull back so think about if you're if you're a medical doctor think about if you're a social worker if you're a dietitian our lived experience is different when we go into the room and then how are we addressing that are we asking questions are we asking open-ended opinions or are we going in and just making statements and talking to people so as we we kind of are thinking about uh, provider self-awareness like we have we have with CF talked a lot about shared decision-making and collaborating with a patient and a family I have experienced at my center when a parent advocates for a child like I know we need to be admitted but can we wait just two weeks because she really wants to go to prom I think that's appropriate because prom is important to teenagers right the medical team is like oh my god i can't believe they want to wait like her cf is so important and she needs to be admitted right now why do they want to wait until prom i'm like it's seven days do you think it's a big deal no okay so it's it's like to conceptualize those different concepts right like we want the families to speak up for themselves but then when they ask questions you're like why are you questioning me i have a, a family that question palmazine like hey this research inflit says that they tested it on rats Oh my God, why does that bother? Is that a problem? Like, it's just a question. She read the information that you gave her, right? So you want the families to read the information. You want them to advocate for themselves. You want them to be an expert on themselves and an expert on their family unit or parents, an expert on their children. But then when they push back or they ask questions, you get it. Fr we sometimes get frustrated and we need to look at where that's coming from, right? Like, we need to address that. So, this isn't my favorite image, but I think it does depict like, like the child is like, hey, it's my body. I know what's happening inside. And then the parent is like, I'm literally a board certified doctor. And then this is a politician that's saying like, we can't be trusted with your own decisions. So that's, the, it's like very political and I'm anti-political. But the main part that I wanna point out is that like, we do this to people. When I shadowed for my mentee mentor program with Susan Horky, her patient was very annoyed because she couldn't sleep at night and she asked for them to give her Benadryl at night and they were like, no, we'll give you melatonin. And she's like, I don't, melatonin doesn't work for me. And they're like, well, that's what we give all the patients. And she's like, I'm literally 26. I've been living with this disease my whole life. Melatonin doesn't work. I need Benadryl. Can you give me the Benadryl? Right. And so like Susan advocated for her patient to ask the doctors to put in the order for the patient because that's what she needs. But then just to take a moment to just think about that, right? Like we're constantly telling people, oh, this is what you need to do with your body. This is what you need to do with your lungs. This is what you need to do with your life. Oh my God, you wanna be a nurse? You can't be a nurse, you have CF, right? Like just allow them to live and be themselves. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's our goal. So I wanted to kind of talk about that. So when we are looking at making a report of CPS, we shouldn't just assume that we know what's going on. So we should go in and ask open-ended questions, like how do we bridge this gap? How do we address the issues? We have concerns, but how do you do it in a way that's collaborating with the patients and families? So there's a lot of motivational interviewing and there's questions and examples that, I mean, hundreds of questions, but when we did our training, they said just pick like two, pick two questions that you can ask to engage in the conversation that gets them open and talking in a non-defensive way. 
And these are some questions that I like to look at. And this is what I ask my providers for. If they say, hey, we have concerns, we want to make a report on this patient or family, I'm looking at the chart. Have they been, when was their last appointment? Have they been seen in three months? Are they on track to be seen four times a year, which obviously this might change with Trichafta and telehealth, but previously, are they going to get their four visits? How are they doing? How's their BMI? How's their FEV1? Are they stable? And then we can check their refill history. We can see if they're getting that regularly. We do annual reviews on our patients. We meet once a month and cover like four patients. And we go back over the last 12 months and we type everything up in a letter and we send it to our families. And I think it's phenomenal because we get to look at their trend and also they get to look at their trend. So they're like, oh, we've been losing weight for like a year. I didn't even notice. Maybe we need to get back on track with our enzymes or our nutritional supplements. But some families are like, I'm offended because they said I had a poor refill history. Why did they do that? And I'm like, oh, well, actually we look at all, we go through the whole patient list we meet every month. It's not just you that we plucked out of the head. We go in alphabetical order. It takes about two years to get through all the patients, right? And then that made that mom feel better. But another thing that's like polarizing is, is the family communicating with the team, right? Like, hey, they failed their appointment. They canceled again. You need to call and do something. Okay, so I call the family, hey, what's going on? Oh, I had a death in the family. Oh, I completely understand, I'm so sorry about that. What, what can we do to get you rescheduled? Or hey, I saw you missed this appointment, it's very imperative that your child was seen, he's been sick, can you tell me what's happening? Well, my dad has hosp is dying and he's on hospice and I don't have anyone to stay here with him and I just didn't feel right leaving him, right? To drive three hours to go to clinic, to sit for two hours, to drive three hours back. I'm like, I completely understand what do you need? Well, my brother can maybe, maybe I can see if my brother can come sit with him. Okay, perfect. When is your brother off work, right? So she gave me two days that her brother was off work. I took that back to the clinic coordinator. They scheduled the appointment. She came to the appointment. The child was seen. He was stable. His BMI was fine. His FEV1 was fine. And then she went back home to her dad, right? Like it's not always an immediate, like, let's get defects involved. Sometimes it's transportation, like, oh my God, a deer ran out in front of us yesterday. We don't have a car anymore. Oh, cool. I actually can set up transportation. Do you want me to have them pick you up from your house? It's, it's not always like the end of the world, right? So asking questions in an open-ended way can get you so much further with the patient and family because also you're helping them, right? Like if they're in crisis, they're freaking out. They need that support. They don't always have it from their family or other people. So maintaining trust is very important in this situation because you're able, you can, I set clear expectations, take any negative tone away when you're having that conversation, focus on the health of the patient, right? Like I am an advocate for the family and tell it I have to choose between the family and the patient and then I'm an advocate for the patient. But I say that the whole time from the very first introduction, like, hey, I'm the social worker with the CF team. I don't know how many like social workers you've met before. Most people think that we're just baby snatchers. I used to be, I quit that job, right? But like, I'm here to support you, right? So I say like, if the clinician, if the, if the doctor writes a prescription or they say, this is what you need to do every day and you cannot do that that's a barrier and that's what I'm here for I'm here to help overcome the barriers so if you can't if you don't have transportation that's a barrier let's work together if you don't have insurance that's a barrier let's work together you can't afford that copay that's a barrier let's work together are you having mental health issues and you can't get out of bed that's a barrier right because your child is a hundred percent dependent on you and your ability to do that and the video with the mom the Hispanic mom from Tiffany's video I say that like your child can sense how you go in the room your child can sense if you're scared they can sense if you're nervous they can sense if you hate it they can sense if you all you can think about is they're gonna die and if you're just mad and aggravated that you have to do this treatment they're gonna be mad and aggravated too so take a minute to like woosa right engage in your senses pull in CBT I do like a real quick like I don't, I don't give all the scientific stuff. I'm just like, all right, what are five things you can do in 30 seconds? Go lock yourself in the bathroom, light a candle, play a song. Anything that you can do real quick. What are real quick things that you can do that will pull yourself out of this scenario? And then five things that maybe are like 30 minutes. Go for a walk with your kid color with your kid watch a goofy movie with your kid so like something that they can gauge in that they can woo saw that they can calm down and just like huh. okay 
Now let's make this a positive experience. We're going to do our treatments, and whenever we are do, do our treatments, we're going to do the, watch a special video together, right? So then it's it's special, it's bonding, it's important, it's positive. So I just kind of throw that in there, and then as we're going along, I just keep coming back to that, and I keep asking, what are your goals? How are you doing? An easy thing to ask is why. I'm not doing that. Oh, can you tell me more about that? Like, what are your, what, why are you feeling this way? Well, okay, pick solid, solid thing. Patient was getting admitted for 14 days, needed three different IV antibiotic therapies, didn't want to pick line. Why not? Well, I don't, I don't like when they put that thing over my face because it makes me feel claustrophobic and I can't breathe and I can't move and I just feel trapped. Oh, cool. Like, that's an easy fix. We can lift it up a little bit, right? Like, not completely on your face. So just asking why or tell me more about that, that can go so much further than you have to get this. I know I'm going super fast. If a patient ends up being in false, so when you make a report, and I don't know the full, I wanted to pull in, like, who does what discipline, but I don't know where everyone is. So, like, when you call in a report to Child Protective Services, they can either screen it in for family support or investigations, or they can completely screen it out and say there's not enough evidence here. So some questions that they ask is, how does this neglect or abuse impact the child? And then they're gonna ask about other community resources and how that can help the child. But if the child ends up in foster care, to partner with them, you have to have the contact information for the case manager. And then I will request that they stay at the same CF center, because I currently have a kid that's like three hours away and there's another CF center that's closer, but she's a teenager and there's so much fun. And uh, she has a lot of behavior issues. So just being with like any type of stability and we're the only stability that she has right now as her CF team and the foster parent agreed to that. Um, I also give like a basic overview of CF. So the mental health coordinators created that overview of CF for mental health professionals a long time ago at seven pages. Anytime I make a report, I submit that with the report to the case manager so that they know that what this chronic illness is and what it can do to the body. Because otherwise they're clueless, right? We're the experts. So if we just make a report because they're not showing up to clinic, they might still not show up to clinic. Or more importantly, if we make a report because they're not taking the medications, the caseworker can go to the home maybe mom's a nurse, if they can recite everything that they're supposed to do, the case manager has no clue if they're actually doing it or not. They don't know if they're doing the breathing treatments. They don't know if they're taking the medicine. I had a case manager tell me, well, they didn't get the refills because they have a bag with like 10 inhalers in it. <laughs> okay, so like, let's think about this. If it's a 30 day prescription, they shouldn't have a bag with all of that extra medication in it, right? But if you don't have that communication with the case manager, they'll never know. Additional things to consider, I kind of touched on this briefly, is like the, the dynamics in the household. And if it's a single parent or a two parent, and then I was gonna go through different scenarios, but basically I have a 10 year old patient, again, not my patient, stock Google photo. Um, mom used to be a pharmacy tech, then she stopped working because she was having health issues. They failed and canceled four appointments in a row. There was absolutely no discussion of making a report. Part of that is because mom was in contact with the team. We were able to get in touch with her. She was consistent. We knew she was having health issues, but not a single person on the team questioned the fact that she failed or canceled four times. Again, not my patient. 15-year-old uh, male, this mom used to be a nurse. She quit her job at some point so that she could keep him on Medicaid because she couldn't afford the private insurance. So they were getting disability. And then she inherited like a family business, which gave her way too much money. So they were scheduled for like four different providers in one day. They came for CF and GI and missed the other two appointments. And the team wanted me to make a report for medical neglect. And they also wanted to not refill the trikafta because she was not doing what they told her to do. Like, so do you see how that, the, this mom, when she comes to clinic is like, I'm not doing that because I am a nurse and I know that my son doesn't need that, right? But they're like, but we're the CF team and we're telling you that he does. So there's a lot of tension there because she is, aggressive in her opinions as a mother versus just being passive in her opinions as a mother. So then looking at like, how can we look into our own provider bias and self-awareness, kind of check in with yourself, look at the facts, be mindful of your tone. And then again, facts and like taking yourself personally out of the situation and why you're making those decisions. 
and then I'm supposed to talk about <laughs> uh, burnout and like secondary trauma, compassion fatigue, how dealing with these patients every single day impacts us as providers. So like if you just had a patient die and then you go into a room with a teenager who's being non-compliant, you're going to be different in how you react to them because you're going to be so upset that like this other kid just died and you just don't get it. So we have to kind of look into that. Also, how that self, how our like lack of self care can impact us. So the stress that we deal with, it impacts every aspect of our body and our emotions. So even if you're good at being culturally sensitive, you might just be having a really bad day, right? So that's the importance of self care. There is a self care wheel that was discovered. So this looks at each aspect of the person as a whole, and then gives you specific things that you can do. Like you can do yoga, you can go get a massage, you can do physical exercise to just kind of control that sense of stress that's building up that like maybe you're ignoring. I stress this a lot with social work students because that's one of the main signs of like people burning out and quitting. Um, these are again a whole list. I will share this um, information, but some of the easy takeaways that I did, because I did a full session on this, is like have a routine when you go to work. So you go in, you get your coffee, you check your email, you check your voicemail, you make a to-do list for the day. When you leave work, you still have a routine. You change your clothes out of your work clothes into different clothes. You maybe watch a TV show for 30 minutes that's like a comedy or something, something that's mindless and you can just laugh at. So just having something to separate yourself from the job. And then remembering like, there's a lot of things going on with the patient and the family that you don't know about and you will never know about if you don't ask questions. Another thing that I was gonna do, and I'm not gonna make you raise hand, well actually, okay. Everyone on this side of the this third straight back, raise your hand. All right, and then one in three people, one in three children experience child sexual abuse, okay? So everyone on this side, raise your hand. One in three people experience domestic violence. So when I say there's so much more than what's going on in the exam room, literally, statistically, there's so much more than what's going on in that exam room. So don't just assume that they hate you. Don't just assume that they have such a crappy life at home because a teenager isn't even talking to the mom in the room, right? Like maybe there's other things going on that they just don't think is appropriate to share with you because maybe they don't trust you enough yet. So that's, that's like the main takeaway is that we can meet the families, we can support the families, and we have to just ask open-ended questions if we and, and respect their answers if we want them to trust us right and one of the main things that I think is going to come up again is like where trikafta falls with all of this right so because I have parents that are saying they don't want their child on trikafta and I have team members that are saying like that's neglectful right like they deserve to have access to this medication well what about the side effects what about the mental health side effects what about the the liver enzyme side effects what about how is that going to impact the patient right like what if their cf isn't that bad is there a fev1 number that we're going to put on there that like is going to make it where we like we report if they're below 70 percent so i just feel like that's coming and so that's what i wanted to touch on i'm so sorry that we ran over I went as fast as possible. I will share these. Does anybody have questions that feels like staying? Mm -hmm. <laughs>